All right, everybody, welcome to Net DevOps Live. We are getting ready to get started in Season 2, Episode 2, and joining us today is Eric Thiel. Eric leads our Infrastructure Advocates team in Cisco DevNet, and he has been kind enough to join us today and talk about some of his suggestions he gives when helping people pick their, pick their first network automation project. Um, as always, as Eric is going through his presentation, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A panel. I'll be manning that and answering questions as they go through. And as always, the first question is usually, where can we get the slides and content that Eric will be sharing? The slides are already posted up on NetDevOps Live as part of the webinar resources for this session. And the video for the session will be posted as soon as we get the editing completed and published on there so you'll be able to find it. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Eric and let him start sharing and we can dive right into our content. All right. Thanks a lot, Hank. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, we are, as Hank mentioned here, to talk about picking your first network automation project. Uh, as he said, I lead the developer advocacy team within Cisco DevNet, but as a little bit extra background, uh, prior to this role, I worked in, as a net DevOps architect uh, for, uh, for a large group inside of Cisco. And what that entailed is I went out to a lot of customers and who were just starting on their net DevOps journey, their network automation journey, and brainstormed with them how to, how to get started, what types of projects should they be looking at to, uh, to start tackling this with. And so that's the context I'm bringing into this is I've done probably 30 or so workshops over the past couple of years with customers and learned a lot of lessons out of it. So hopefully you guys can pick some of those up over the course of this workshop and, uh, and have ideas to go forward and start your own first network automation project. So with no further ado, uh, please do, if you're, if you're attending, please do go to this URL. It uh, gives us an opportunity to track the interest around NetDevOps Live. Uh, the more people we know are interested, the more we know we should keep doing these sessions. So it gives us a chance to get an idea of, of who all is, is attending and is interested in the topics we're giving. So today, what are we going to talk about? We're going to start out just with some high-level discussion around uh, how to brainstorm your first idea. Um, it may seem obvious, but there's a few things I've picked up over, over time that really help inspire the ideas. Uh, then we're going to go on to how to actually whittle down from what you've come up with for ideas and figure out what's a good one to start with. Uh, we'll then work on how do you actually start building out the workflow of that how to choose your tools, and then I'll show you an example of how you could implement a couple of the ones that I came up with, uh, just to give you an idea of how, how simple it might be to get your first project off the ground. So before we start, two important things that I've picked up over time. One is the age old adage, perfect is the enemy of good. A lot of people set forth on these projects and they end up not finishing because they say, look, I just couldn't get over the hump on this one little thing. It just wasn't working quite as I expected or as I wanted. I just abandoned it. And it's important to understand when you're getting started, this can be a very daunting task trying to automate things in your network. It can be challenging. So you need to start out and, and celebrate the things that you get right. Uh, things like the first time you connect on to a device and, and you're connected via SSH or, or whatever protocol you're using. That's actually a pretty good first step. And it's important to not get hung up on, it's, I don't have a great UI or the output isn't quite what I wanted. Uh, it's, it's important to start small and then keep growing into the more robust things over time. Uh, the other is, and we'll have a whole section on this, is choosing the best tool, not only for the job, but based on what skills you already have. So it's, uh, we'll drive, we'll dive into that and I'll give you a little more color behind that in a little bit here. So typically when I met with customers, the first step was sit down and figure out what exactly do you want to do? You've been given this task of, you need to start automating more, you need to become more efficient. So how do you go about doing that? So I always start those sessions out with a whiteboard. I think that there's no better way to uh, get a collaborative brainstorm going than to actually sit down with pen in hand and, and brainstorm some ideas. But there's a few things to pay attention to while you're doing that. The first is don't do it alone. Uh, most of you are on teams of, of a number of people. So get a bunch of people in the room and just start capturing ideas from the whole group. And a lot of the ideas might 
you know, not end up coming becoming viable options, but it's important to get as many different perspectives as possible uh, for this initial kind of brainstorming session. When you're doing this brainstorming, the one thing I would encourage you to do is don't filter ideas, don't start debating ideas. A lot of times uh, I've seen people suggest an idea and other people say, well, no, we've already got that covered or uh, that doesn't make sense to automate because that system's gonna go away in a few months. Lots of different feedback on the ideas that are being presented. And the problem is that ultimately ends up stifling some of your creativity. So it's important to just capture whatever is coming out as it comes out, write it up on the board, and it can be filtered out later if it doesn't make sense or it isn't relevant. But the more you block ideas before they even get listed, the more people in the room don't really feel comfortable sharing their ideas, and it ends up being a bit of a roadblock. So I encourage you, don't filter them out initially. Uh, now, one of the biggest challenges is uh, in coming up with good topics is lack of inspiration. So I can't tell you how many times I've sat down and thought, I need to work on a new talk, I wanna work on a new demo, I just don't have any good ideas of how to what I want to actually demonstrate. So a lot of times when you get hung up like that, it helps to start asking some questions to try and start eliciting some other ideas. So usually here's a few questions that I'll ask that, that get a lot of conversation started. So the first is, what tasks do you spend the most time on weekly? Uh, automation tends to boil down to finding ways to streamline your day-to-day -day tasks or your repetitive tasks or your most time-consuming tasks. So that one question typically unlocks a lot of interesting ideas. Now again, a lot of them might not end up being great candidates for your first automation project, but you'll at least have ideas of what are things that across your entire team may be the most time consuming tasks. And it gives you a great, great place to start the discussion. Next up is what have been the causes of any kind of recent issues you've had? So maybe you had a network maintenance that you did that caused an outage or had a brownout condition somewhere on the network, uh, some unexpected result out of that maintenance, or uh, maybe someone installing a new device caused a chain reaction of events. What are the kind of things to look uh, that have caused those outages? Because a lot of times those are triggered by maybe someone didn't check the config before they put in a different config, Maybe there were other conditions that if they had realized they were in existence, they would have behaved differently. Uh, and those are potentially also good ideas because we as humans, when we go to configure a new protocol or, ch or bring a new port up or down, we think of a few things off the top of our head that are worth checking before we do that work. But there's probably dozens of things that would be useful to check that we don't think of. And what I a great idea behind that is as you're going to do a maintenance, what if you could actually check the 20 most common uh, things? What ports have devices on them? What ports are up and down? Things like that. And based on the conditions, you could decide go or no go. If anything's unexpected, maybe you don't go uh, and you evaluate why things aren't what you expected. So that's a potential opportunity for, uh, for automation. Anywhere where you have processes that have caused unexpected results, Maybe you could build some checks into there uh, to try and prevent that for future. The next is uh, the fun one. What don't you like about your job? Um, now, again, lots of things may not be solvable by automation, but there's lots of things. Uh, when I brainstormed with customers, I say, you know, there's this one thing, this one task that I have to do every week is really frustrating. It's not an efficient use of my time. I should be working on higher level things. I should be working on designs, not this repetitive task. So that's a good opportunity to say, what don't you like? Maybe we can find a way to automate that or at least automate the parts of it you don't like. Other examples along that line, maybe uh, if I have to work back and forth with another team to exchange information, and it's always a very slow or painful process trying to get the right information back and forth, that might be an opportunity to automate the process a little bit where you can electronically exchange the information in a predictable format so that it's easy to consume and easy to provide. That might be able to help where now this long to repetitive task is automated and you just get the information in exactly the format you need. So those are all good questions that tend to prompt a lot of discussion. But even if after all of those, you're still struggling to think of any ideas, I'd encourage you to go check out DevNet, DevNet Code Exchange at the URL included. 
And what that is, is that's a curated list of code repos that people have submitted. And I think we're up to a few hundred at this point. Um, but you could filter down or search for topics of interest. So if you search for data center or you search for uh, uh, DNA center, for instance, Cisco DNA center, you can go and see what other people are automating behind these platforms. And the nice thing is these are all code examples that are uh, licensed for public use, so uh, reusable or open source. Uh, they all have well-documented readmes, so it's something that you could go and try out yourself. And they tend to be fairly relevant to the infrastructure in uh, groups of people that we typically work with uh, because we're curating that list for you. So it's a great way to go and get some inspiration, say, oh, I really like what they did. Maybe I could do something along that lines that better that's a better fit for our environment. So, okay, so we've got some general rules for how to, how to start the whiteboarding session. Let's actually dive into it and see what we might come up with if we were doing one of those sessions live. There's a lot of you on the call, so we're not gonna do it interactively, but I do encourage you, if you're just getting started with automation, you're not sure you could actually accomplish some of the tasks that are coming to mind uh, as we've been talking through this, feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we'll make note of those. And who knows, maybe it's something that we can do, put together some sample code for or a demo uh, down the road that you'll be able to then leverage if it's something that you think may be beyond what you're capable of. And then at the same time later on in this session, maybe after seeing how we get started, maybe you'll be inspired and decide that yes, you actually could try it yourself. All right, so a few things, and these are all inspired by sessions I've done, so I've just kind of picked a handful of common topics, but Managing access lists on firewalls. I got that one a ton of times. People saying adding and removing rules are very, it's a very cumbersome process. We could use some help in automating that process. Uh, there's, we have too many different software versions in use across all our devices. We'd like to try and get those standardized and shrunk down. Uh, it's slow when we have to make a change across 100 different devices or 1,000 or 10 or however many devices you have in your, in your environment it's painful to have to SSH to each one and go and make the change manually. Uh, testing after any given maintenance that I do takes a lot longer than the actual maintenance because I need to go and check and do pings between all these different devices and I need to uh, check logs and I need to do all this different stuff. The maintenance may take a couple of minutes, but the actual testing afterwards takes much, much longer. And we need to audit for compliance for name your preferred compliance that you have to comply with PCI HIPAA any of the above uh, and as such we have this gold config that we want to make sure is enforced in, on all of our devices but right now I it's a manual process and it takes a lot of time anytime an auditor comes in we cover up weeks of time across the entire team just to go and confirm our compliance with the requirements so those are all things that I've heard in multiple workshops and I think I'm guessing at least one or two of them resonates with uh, each of you on the call. So let's talk through that a little bit and figure out where would we take it now that we've got a list and, and typically we'll have 20, 30 things on the whiteboard, but I'm just for expediency, I'm giving you a subset of what I might see in any given workshop. So how do you take that list and actually work forward into what might be a good candidate? Well, typically what I'll do now, you've gathered your whole team inside the room or a, a, a group of people inside the room. So I find the easiest way is give everyone a, a Sharpie or a, a dry erase marker and say, go mark your top three or four or five, depends on how many total items you have in the list. Things that are take a lot of your time that are relevant to you or that you think are important or critical. And so as you go through, people might go through and start marking off and it will become apparent which ones are maybe the most popular or most impactful in that list. In this case, you'll see uh, we had a few of them that ranked higher than others. These couple were a little bit lower than others. So we'll make note of that. So, okay, great. This one seems to have the most check marks. What do we think about that? Well, this this session in particular is doing your first automation with uh, your first network automation project so something like changing software versions it's a great project but it's a little bit more advanced than something we probably want to take on as our very first project uh, it can have some complexity to it dependencies things like making sure that when you reload the box it doesn't break the entire network so i wouldn't encourage that as your first project Next most popular was this one. Testing after maintenance takes longer than you would expect. 
Now this one's interesting. It's it's read only. We're really just looking at attributes of a bunch of different devices. So it gives you some some interesting power without actually being invasive or potentially uh, exposing yourself to outages or, or changes of configs that have unintended consequences. So that's a pretty interesting one. Let's let's make note of that one. And then the next most common one is uh, enforcing compliance with a baseline config. Well, so that one. It is changing things, and typically I don't recommend anything that involves changing configs for your first script, but there is a second component to it, which is auditing. So maybe we could look at this from just the audit perspective, where we could define what standards we care about, and then we could just audit against them and make sure that we're in compliance. We could leave the actual remediation or enforcement to a manual process. All right, so let's drill into those a little bit. So the first thing you want to do once you actually pick some topics that you want to work on is uh, you want to think, how would I do this manually? The thing with computers are they're no different than us. They have to actually follow a set of logic no different than you would when you sit down at a keyboard and SSH onto a box. So it's very important to take the time up front to figure out what exactly would I do and then figure out a lot of those what ifs. What if it's not what I expected? How would I handle that condition? Because if you don't account for conditions that you would be able to handle as a human, uh, then your script might do things you wouldn't do as a human. If you see that uh, there's a problem on a device, you would probably stop so the rest of your changes until you work that out. So you want to think through that workflow and try and accommodate as much as possible what those variables could be in this situation. So for the first one, we'll start with the uh, doing maintenance takes longer than, an, than the actual task because of doing all the testing. How would I actually handle that manually? Well, I'd probably SSH into the router that I'm, uh, that I'm working on or the site that I'm working on. And I'd look at my OSP, OSPF or BGP neighbors uh, and kind of eyeball it and say, yeah, that looks about like what I expected to. And then afterwards, I'll probably get onto the same device and I'll again say, yeah, that looks just about right. Uh, I don't notice any difference, so we're probably good there. Uh, I'm probably going to do a bunch of pings. I'm going to get on three or four devices and, and ping to the other three or four devices and, and make sure that I have general connectivity. Um, and then maybe I'll do a show log on a few devices to see no ports bounced or no neighbors went down or anything unexpected that uh, might make me think that I should look further let's talk about how we would do the second use case manually so for the second one how would we audit and enforce compliance against a gold standard well chances are you're going to start out in notepad and you're going to build a list of config commands that you want to see on every device and you might spell those out in chunks or by type of device but you're ultimately going to have a list of commands that you want to make sure are on all your devices um, then you're going to go and you're going to build a list of devices. Now, maybe that's just a list of SSH connections in PuTTY, or maybe it's uh, a text file that you manually SSH to each one. And every time you want to do an audit, you're going to connect to each one and you're going to show running config. And you're going to look at that versus the list of configs in your uh, notepad and make sure that it looks more or less correct. Um, this is traditionally what a lot of people do for their audits. And... It's obviously a very time consuming uh, effort. Uh, you then also need to look for anything that is in the config that wasn't in your notepad that shouldn't be there. So if you have any extra users that shouldn't exist on the device, you need to make note to look for those as well. Those wouldn't be captured in your notepad, but if you have a list of users in your notepad, you wanna make sure those are the only list of users. Uh, and then you wanna ultimately after doing all of those steps, you're going to end up building a list of changes, probably also still in Notepad, uh, with all of the devices and what needs to be changed on each of those devices to get them up to compliance. And then you're going to go open a bunch of tickets so that you can actually get a change window scheduled and you can go and manually do those all those changes and then go and do the audit again to make sure you're, you're in compliance. So very, very time consuming. I've, I've been through this with a ton of customers doing it manually and it is a very painful process and I think ripe for automation. So how would we actually start solving for some of those? I think the most important piece of the conversation is uh, choosing your tool. And I mentioned up front that you want to choose a tool not only based on what your task is, but based on your skill set. And 
And I love uh, I love analogies, so we'll use an analogy to kind of get get the point across because this is a debate I've had with a lot of people. Um, so what, imagine for a second that there's going to be a race and you get to choose which of these three vehicles is going to win that race. Now, chances are, if you know anything about vehicles, you're probably going to say, well, obviously the F1 car is going to be the fastest. Uh, it's going to win the race. Well, that's usually true, but I didn't mention in this race, there's some really narrow bits and uh, the F1 car won't be able to fit through. And in fact, the Mini probably won't even fit through. So while that is often the best tool or the most powerful tool for this race, the motorcycle is the only one that's going to actually be able to make it through to the completion of the race. Uh, now let's reset that. Okay, same question again. Which car would win this next race that we're going to do? Well, in this race, it's got lots of bumps and it's a very uh, rocky road and it's got some gravel. Uh, so guess what? Neither the F1 car or the motorcycle are probably the right fit for that one. In that case, the Mini happens to be the most uh, flexible on trains that it can go across. Now use this analogy because there's a ton of tools out there for network automation. And depending on A, what your skills are and B, where you're going, uh, can really help drive that. Now, if you're on open road, the F1 car could be best, but if you've never driven an F1 car, you're probably not actually gonna get it to move. Uh, it's a very difficult car to drive. Uh, and same with the motorcycle. If you've never driven a motorcycle, staying upright can be a challenge on your first try. So it's important to factor in your existing skill set or the skill set of who you're gonna be working with when choosing that tool. If you have an F1 driver that you can have drive for you, that's great. That's probably gonna be a very powerful and flexible tool for you. So the same exact thing happens with network automation. And we have a number of different tools in our tool belt to choose from. So I'll give you a few examples. It's in no way exhaustive. This is just when you're starting out for your first uh, networking project or network automation project. These are some of the most common ones I run across. So it may be that you don't know any code, you're not interested in learning any code, you really just have a few uh, examples like maybe that code upgrade example, or you wanna enforce some base standards on your devices you may not actually have to build anything yourself. You might be able to use something like a network controller, DNA Center or uh, ACI's APIC controller, and those can do those tasks out of the box just fine. That may be all you need for your definition of network automation or your most important use cases. And the great thing there is you buy it, you put it, a, you install it, you, you flip a switch and it's doing what you need it to do. No, uh, no customization necessarily required. But then as you start getting a little bit more advanced or uh, you want to start doing some more custom workflows, you might have a tool, something like Genie CLI. And I'll show you an example of this later, but it, it's part of the Pi ATS test package. But the thing I really like about Genie CLI is it runs as just a freestanding app. You can just execute it with no code required. It can do a number of tasks like assess the current state of your network. So if you feed in a bunch of devices to it, it can assess uh, BGP attributes or OSPF attributes across your network, including things like number of neighbors, interface states, things like that. So it's a really powerful tool. It's borderline on what I would call network automation, but it could automate a lot of tasks for you in a somewhat turnkey fashion. So it's an interesting tool to solve, uh, and you may be thinking back to the list of examples we had. It could align pretty well with some of the examples we had. Next would be a, a pretty popular one these days is Ansible. We get, I got asked about that a lot uh, as I did these workshops. It's a relatively easy to use configuration management tool and you don't need to know any Python coding behind the scenes to be able to make it work. So it's great. And again, I'll show you a little bit of an example later. It's great because you can look and you could probably get some use cases off the ground very quickly without any coding experience uh, just by using Ansible and, and building a playbook out of it. Uh, where that comes up short is as you need to start doing much more custom things, or if you already are very well versed in Python, maybe you're coming at this from a developer environment and you're just starting to learn infrastructure or networking. Um, that may not be the right tool because you already know Python. Perhaps you have a, an existing tool set or skill set that lends itself to writing custom code and you have some very custom use cases that may not be the best fit then. Uh, you have things like, <coughs> excuse me, things like Napalm, 
which is a Python library that abstracts a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks uh, and a lot of the different devices. So you can actually give it um, higher level commands and it will understand how to apply it to a number of different types of platforms. So if you're managing some NXOS, some iOS devices, some ASAs, whatever those platforms may be, you can actually tell it some more high level things like get the config or make this change without having to know some of the nuanced, here's the command I need to type and this is the order I need to type it in and I need to look for this response. Then there's NSO, which is uh, Cisco Network Service Orchestrator. It allows things like building CLI-based device templates and you can apply it across a diverse set of platforms with a singular tap template and it also understands things like rollback. So if someone goes in and changes a device manually, you can get some of that auditing done that we talked about earlier. It can alert and say, hey, this device has changed from the baseline. What do you want to do? Do you want to roll it back or do you want to keep what's been changed? So it has some integrated, uh, ter almost turnkey ways of managing those audits and saying, yes, I do want to roll it back. I know that's not an authorized config. Uh, or you can ingest the updated configs and make that your new baseline. So pretty powerful there in, in the ways you can apply it across a lot of different platforms. And then the last one I'll mention is Python itself. So if you already know Python, it's great. I For your first project, if you don't know Python, I don't necessarily encourage going out and learning it just to try and get to a first automation task. Some of these other ones I think are a great way to just get started and then work your way into Python. But if you already know it, using Python with something like the request library allows you to interact with REST-based APIs and you can get uh, a lot of effective work done uh, very quickly as long as you understand the basic constructs. All right, so once you pick a tool, you also then sometimes have to choose what kind of protocol you want to use. There, there's three main protocols that I work with when I'm doing automation. RESTConf is a web-based uh, API available in a lot of newer uh, platforms, and it tends to offer a bit more performance than the other two options might. Um, so if it's available, it might be a, a solid choice to go with. Um, now, since we are talking about your first project, uh, that may be something to save for a later project just because it typically means working with something like Python directly and coding against the APIs. Um, so it tends to be a little bit more complex, may not be the best first choice. Uh, NetConf is the next. That one's been around for quite a while now. Uh, all the major platforms support it for a, a device level configuration. Um, it does still leverage SSH underneath, uh, but it uses XL, XML formatting to do very reliable and robust uh, interactions with the device. The reason I say that is uh, the third option, which is kind of the most common I run across, is CLI based. And it's great because it's ubiquitous. It can work on any platform for the most part because you're really just pretending you're typing real time. But uh, at the same time, it's dependent on understanding the output. So as if any of you have ever SSH'd into a device, you know if you do a show version, you're gonna get some plain text. And automating via CLI does require interpreting that text and figuring out what the right formatting is to ingest it. So something like a NetConf actually gives you a bit more formatted responses. It can be very powerful in that regards because it helps uh, make sure that you're interpreting it properly. So those are the three. Again, most of the tools will lend themselves specifically to one, so you don't necessarily need to think too much about that early on. But I wanted to point it out because sometimes you will have a choice and here's some of the thoughts that go into my head as to why I might choose one or the other. All right, so let's actually talk about the tools that we went through and, and choose one for each of our tasks that we talked about. The first one is the, uh, when I do a maintenance, it takes a lot longer to actually do the testing, make sure that everything's back up uh, afterwards than it does to do the work. So conveniently enough, this is one I he heard a lot, uh, but there's a tool that I frankly just recently discovered myself uh, that is uh, perfectly lends itself to this and it doesn't require any code and that's the one I mentioned earlier with the, which is Genie CLI. Um, it is open sourced and it is, I do have links at the end that you'll be able to go and check it out yourself but the nice thing is it allows you to define a set of devices in your network and uh, and, it, and you can run against that and say basically capture what the current state of my network is 
and then you can compare multiple states. So if I take it before my maintenance and after my maintenance, I can actually tell it to tell me what has changed since I performed my maintenance without having to go and do that manual stare and compare or the manual ping tests across a bunch of different devices. It can very quickly tell me what, what's going on in my network and has anything unexpected changed. Uh, it leverages the PyETS library behind the scenes. Now, I'm not going to get into PyETS itself because that's, I wouldn't consider that a beginner thing. It's, it's very robust and powerful. Uh, but the fact that GNU CLI uses it behind the scenes is great because it means as you graduate into more complex tasks, you already have an understanding of how that's working. And you could always leverage PyETS in your own Python scripts as you start looking for more power, growing more robust. Now, the reason I like CLI, Genie CLI so much is, like I said, you don't have to learn any code. And just as an example of that, I, I captured what a single task might look li like in NetMiko, which is one of the common Python libraries. Um, and all of this would accomplish a show version. And I could print it back out. Now, this isn't actually going to ingest the show version. It isn't going to determine just that one little string that is the version. It's just grabbing a big chunk of text. So technically, if I wanted to do more with this, like say, print an error if it's got a specific version on it, it would actually take me a lot more steps to go through and parse out the output of the show version. So while very powerful, it ends up being a bit more coding to, to make a simple task happen. Now compare that to something like Genie CLI, where I can just tell it, go learn the config and the routing state for anything that I've defined as lab.yaml. So lab.yaml is my definition of all of my hosts, and I'll show you that in a minute. And I want to save that all to a directory. So with a single command, I'm telling it go out, and if that lab file has a thousand devices in, it might take a little while, but it'll go out and tell me the state of all thousand devices, both their running config and uh, the routing information. So what route, what routes are in the table, what parameters are set, things like that. So very powerful and very easy to use. It doesn't, it would take a little bit of work to integrate this into a larger workflow. Um, so it's not a perfect solution for everything, but for getting started, I highly encourage people to check it out just because you could run this on your network with very, very minimal risk to any impact. So enough talk, let's actually uh, show you what something like that might look like. Now in my environment, I did cheat. I went ahead and did a baseline config. So if I look at uh, tests, you can see I've already run a test that I've called normal. So pretend this is just a normal day, middle of the work day. I grabbed what the state of my network looks like. Um, and then what I did was I simulated a failure before I started the call, which is I've had a brownout on my WAN and now WAN 1 and 2 see each other still and WAN 3 and 4 see each other, but they can't all see the other half. Uh, typically, or previously it was a mesh where all four could see each other. Now two can see each other and the other two can see each other. So if I got a call or if I did a maintenance and, and at the end I was starting to ping across, it, eventually I might notice that I can't see certain sites or certain routes have disappeared. But with Genie CLI, since before the test I actually did the normal capture, I could do something, um, and I, I have all my commands here just for ease of copy and paste, but initially I did this discovery. I learned my configuration of my routing state uh, for my entire lab, and I outputted it to normal, which is what you're seeing here. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing, but I'm going to output it to out1, which is my first output after my maintenance. Uh, and that will take a second to run, uh, but we'll see it's gathering across four different devices, the config and the routing information. And surprisingly, that's actually not that long. So as you can see, it's running multiple simultaneously. And what it's doing is it's telling me what it learned. So it learned routing config uh, for CSR 14, if I keep scrolling up, it can learn the same for 13, 12, and 11. So it learned all of those attributes about my devices. Now, if I cat commands again, so I've now captured my current state, which I presume is different than my normal operating state because I have caused a simulated failure. So let's just run a genie diff between those two, normal and out one, and see what it tells me. Now, if so, I just got a call saying the network's down, 
I could do these two steps alone and very quickly see, okay, there is, from a config perspective, everything is identical. So I know I no one's gone and messed up the configuration itself, but I can see that routing uh, can be, there's differences found in the routing for each of the four devices. So if I were to do an R edit on, uh, on that, uh, whoops. I will do a VI on that. And I have a, oops, I have a double copy and paste. That's my problem. R edit diff one. I do not know why my copy and paste is misbehaving today. Live demos. There we go. All right, so as you can see, and if any of you are familiar with diff from a Linux command line perspective, the format's gonna look the same. So as I look in here, the minus sign means that it's it's disappeared between my normal and my current state. So I can see I no longer have a route for 192.168.3.0 slash 24. I no longer have a route for 4.0 slash 24. And I see that it changed 21 hours ago, which was when I simulated the failure. So I know now that on this device, I've lost access to, uh, I've lost a certain route. Now I could do the same on 13, 14, and 11, and see, okay, so 13 lost the route for one and two. So that might give me an interesting data point to go and start figuring out, okay, why has BGP lost some of its neighbors? Without having to do a lot of manual stare and compare, I've suddenly gotten to a fairly close approximation of where my problem might be. Now, if I added more into that audit, I could do things like BGP and I could have it report back whether what neighbors have come and gone. And that would have actually made it even more obvious. Uh, for, for time's sake, I wanted to have it as a fairly simple capture, so I, I stuck with that. So if I go in and I do lab one, just to show you what this looks like, my inventory is actually pretty straightforward. There's, you know, there's a lot of lines per device, um, but you can see where I've defined four different CSRs, and this is basically all the attributes that I've set for each one. But if I had a hundred of them, I could just copy and paste, and I could have uh, just find replace, you know, the IP address and the name for each one, and easily define out a lot more hosts in my network. It just so happens for this demo, I wanted to show four different devices. So. That is about the extent of the coding you would have to do is filling in this file to be able to use Genie CLI on your environment today and capture the state in a, in a working state. And then next time you had an outage, you could run it again and capture what a broken state looks like and figure out what's going on there. So very powerful, I think, and a great way to get started when you don't know any coding at all. Because as you can see, no coding required to get it off the ground. So the second use case then is the comparing against a baseline gold config, uh, presumably for compliance reasons. So what would I do? Uh, what would I do for a tool? Well, as I mentioned, I'd want to start with something that can do read only because this is our first uh, automation task. I typically recommend people don't try and do write tasks as their very first one. Um, there's a little bit more risk associated if you didn't account for certain conditions. You could actually break things. But the great thing is, if you just report on state, you could actually manually do your enforcement or do your uh, your true ups, and then you can continue doing the audits and just catch as people are, are modifying things to be out of compliance. So it's a great use case to start with anyway, even if you don't use the enforcement portion. Now, if you know Python, your options open up quite a bit on this one. You could use something like Napalm that I mentioned earlier, which is a great package. Uh, it supports a lot of different capabilities, things like rollbacks, uh, commits, things like that. And it, in a lot of ways, it's similar to Ansible in that it understands current state and understands when it needs to modify it and when it doesn't. Um, but for this case, we're going to presume that we don't know Python. And if we want something simple, something that uh, I've been able to get people up and working on and off the ground in a few hours typically, Ansible is a pretty good choice because it allows uh, for fairly human readable uh, tasks to be done. Um, and 
easy to manipulate once you once someone gives you a working playbook as well. And we'll show you that in a minute here. The nicest thing I for this use case in Ansible is it natively supports something called check mode, which is I can build my playbook as if I wanted to go and enforce state across all my devices, but I can just tell it to run check mode, which means it will tell me what it would have done had I let it. So that's perfect. I could actually build an entire playbook how I think I want it to be in the end, but just run it in audit mode and tell me what's wrong, tell me what's out of compliance. And if I choose, I can go manually remediate or I can let Ansible take care of it myself or itself. So again, rather than talk about it, let's actually just go look at what it looks like. So first things first, I will show you what uh, my Ansible uh, inventory looks like. So similar to with Genie CLI, I do need to tell it what hosts I'm working with. So in this case, I've defined my four CSR routers in my inventory file. Um, we're not here to talk about best practice or anything. I have hard-coded passwords in here. Don't do that in real life, um, but for purposes of demonstration, uh, you now all know my password. Uh, I will then look at what uh, our playbook itself looks like. And I've done a pretty straightforward one. I've made up some things. This may or may not be what you need for your compliance, but it's illustrating a point. So what I'm going to do is I'm telling it I want it to run against all of my CSRs as defined in that inventory. And I just wanted to go through the config and look for certain lines. And if they're not there, I wanted to put them in there. So some of the most common things you'll run across, time zone, all setting all your clock settings right, setting timestamp debugging and logging for all of your devices, setting a domain name. Uh, in this case, I'm enabling a couple of protocols uh, for automation, API protocols, set some spanning tree parameters, enable web services, uh, require SSH version two, and set an NTP server. So fairly common list of tasks that you might do across all your devices. You could put in logging, you could put in a number of other things as well. But as written right now, uh, this will connect to any of those devices that happen to be running iOS and it would enforce all of these. Now, what did I just get done saying? We don't actually want it to enforce anything because this is our first script ever and we're a little bit gun shy. We want to see what would happen. So in that case, I could do something like Ansible Playbook uh, 1 and I'm going to give the dash C dash V tags at the end. So what I'm saying is I want to run this playbook that I just showed you against my inventory, but I'm going to run it in check mode, which is the dash capital C. And that's saying, don't actually do anything. Just see what you would have done. And then the dash V is useful when you're running check mode, because what it'll do is it'll say, print out all of the commands that you actually would have typed in on the CLI. So at the end of the day, Ansible is just SSHing into these devices, same as you would in typing. Um, so doing the dash V tells me, tells it to print out what those actual commands would have been. So I'm going to run that and it again, will take a second and it will spit out the output of what it thinks it should have done. So if it look, if we look at device number one, CSR one is dot 11, the only command it thinks it needs to add is NTP server 8888. So it is mostly in compliance. There's only one thing that's out of compliance. Now it doesn't necessarily go in order. So we go to device four and that one has, someone seems to have removed the rest conf config. So it needs to re-add that config and then it also needs the NTP server. Device two, same thing. Device three has a bit more change. So someone's been in messing around on that device. It actually needs to fix the time zone. It has a wrong one right now. It needs to add uh, timestamping back on for debug messages. And then it still also needs to do refs conf and NTP. So with that fairly basic set of code, I'm able to audit. And again, I could run this on a thousand devices if I wanted. It would take a bit longer, um, but I could audit it the same way. I'll put all of this and then maybe I go and manually remediate this for my first test. And then I come back and I see if it all worked and I run the audit again. Um, the nice thing is if, uh, because it's fairly human readable, you guys could probably all modify this today and do your own checks. So I could just do something as simple as 1.1.1.1. And now it'll do the exact same thing again. Uh, if I had already remediated all the rest, it would just tell me it needs to add 1111. It's a very easy, low friction way to get into automation. 
And again, because you're not changing anything, the risk of impact to your environment is minimal. Uh, I do still always caution, you know, do a maintenance window, try it out in the lab, things like that, just because you want to make sure that nothing unexpected happens. But when you're doing things that are only reading, it's pretty powerful and uh, pretty low risk. All right, so um, I will, actually I'll show you one other just because I had it there. Um, I also had an advanced option. So that was great. It showed a very basic list of commands. There's a number of other things that I won't dive into, but just to show where you could take something like Ansible and you could grow into some more complex tasks. I'll just show you what it looks like. So I have the same kind of baseline. It's gonna do the same, what, 10 or 12 commands. But there's some other things I could do too if you do want to get into your second and third script. Um, it gives you some capabilities to grow beyond just a flat list of commands. So I could do something like I could loop over multiple items. So in this case, maybe I want to set the same settings for my VTYs and my console, setting an exec timeout to zero. Or maybe I want to loop through a list of NTP servers that I've defined somewhere else and I want to go and set so maybe I have 10 NTP servers or five NTP servers, I could have it loop through. Now, I'm, I'm not going to explain necessarily the nuance of how all this works, but I just wanted to point out that I'm showing you a very simple, easy way to get started, but I'm, you're not painted into a corner in that all you can ever do is some flat config files. There's a number of different capabilities as you start using the more advanced capabilities of Ansible in this instance where you could grow and you could do a bunch more interesting things. Um, you could do templates, you could do a number of other things, some of which are covered in subsequent NetDevOps Live talks, uh, but it's not just limited to that very limited demo I'm showing you. All right, so what did we talk about? We talked about how to get started, and I, I can't stress enough, getting a bunch of people in a room and just whiteboarding out some, some ideas You'll be amazed at, you know, A, what other people are struggling with that maybe you found ways to streamline the process, but B, what other people on your team are also struggling with from a time consumption perspective. If you're spending a lot of time on it, chances are other people are, other people are as well, and that's a great opportunity to automate it out uh, and at least streamline the process for you. And then we talked about how to whittle that connection, uh, that list of candidates down to something that may be achievable and something that impacts the most people. We talked about how to then actually sit down and figure out as a human, how would you solve that? So as you're building your script or your automation, you can actually try and make sure you're doing it in the same way and addressing all the same concerns. And then we talked about how to choose your tools. We've, I've given you a list. There's a lot more out there, so it is in no way exhaustive, but hopefully it gave you a few ideas of ways you could get started today with some of the things that you come up with on your whiteboard session. And then I showed you how some of it works. Uh, I did publish. Now they were, as you saw, it's a very limited amount of code for, for that demo, but I thought that it was a great, very limited amount of code that gets you to a functional ending to something that would actually be useful to a lot of you. So I did publish all of that. Uh, jumping to my last link first, you can go to cs.co slash etcode. And that will put you to a, a GitHub repo that has just that little sample that I was working with just now. There's a number of other resources available that I encourage you to go check out. Uh, developer.cisco.com slash Python if you are starting to grow beyond some of the, uh, some of the basics. Uh, Python is pretty widely adopted as the platform for network automation. I won't say it's the only one, but it's one of the most popular. So I encourage you to go check that link out if you want to learn more about Python and how you could use it. Uh, we have a number of learning labs out there, including how to set up your laptop for automation, uh, how to use Ansible for iOS XE, which is some of what I just went through, and how to use PyATS and Genie. Uh, great modules if you liked either of those demos and want to learn more about what a, how you could leverage those tools. Uh, we do have a number of always-on sandboxes available, so we have an iOS one if you wanted to try out some Ansible or some uh, PyATS and Genie CLI against it. You're welcome to do that. Uh, we also have a DNA Center one, so if you say, you know, I really don't think I want to code yet, let me see what that could do from a, a base level automation. You can always hit our Always On Sandbox and try it out yourself. Uh, there's, as with every NetDevOps Live, we have a code challenge. So uh, my challenge to you this week is a little bit unique in that I'm challenging you to go out and whiteboard a session. Uh, get a few people in a room and talk about what challenges you're facing. Uh, use all the, all the criteria that I gave you. 
and then whittle it down to one task that uh, that could use automation only using read only so don't get into writing stuff yet just try gathering information try it out using maybe genie cli ansible or another tool of your choice and then go out and submit it to code exchange and show us what you built uh there is no no automation too small when you're getting started the simplest tasks are still very powerful and may help someone else down the, their journey as well Uh, if you're looking for more information about Net DevOps, we got the Net DevOps landing page on DevNet, which is developer.cisco.com slash Net DevOps. Obviously, there's a ton of other sessions behind this one. Next, uh, Coming up next is taking some operational tasks and automating them. So it's a great follow on to this session if you were inspired by any of the ideas. Uh, we have blogs out at uh, blogs.cisco.com slash tag slash Net DevOps if you want to read more about what's going on in the Net DevOps world. And Hank put together a great programmability basics course uh, at this link down here. I encourage you to check that out. Really good content. I encourage you to stay connected. Uh, here is my Twitter. I'm at Secure Network with no O. Same address on GitHub. Uh, you can always WebEx Teams me at erthiel at cisco.com. And DevNet is very active out on all the social media. So Twitter at Cisco DevNet, uh, Facebook at Cisco DevNet, and GitHub Cisco DevNet. Lots of good code repos under the Cisco DevNet GitHub as well. So if you're looking for inspiration, it's always a great place to go as well. And with that, I'll turn it back to Hank to wrap us up for the day. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, it was an excellent session, and I think you hit on um, more than just the specific examples of good projects, but an approach to picking those projects. That whiteboard session is really critical, and I always come up with excellent ideas whenever I, I host one or just sit in on one for those. So I love the Code Exchange Challenge this week. I'm looking forward to seeing what folks come up with in their own whiteboard sessions. As Eric mentioned, we've got more to come this season, so be sure to join us next week where uh, Big Evil Beard himself, Stuart Clark, will be diving into kind of building on top of what Eric talked about today and looking at how we can make um, network automation part of our operational day job and extending out the use cases that we go. But we are just getting started. Keep an eye on the social medias for all of the upcoming episodes and get registered for them as they're available. And if you miss them live, remember they're all available to stream up on NetDevOps Live. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.